Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Pastor Steve Macias and Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor. Hello again. Today we are going to ask the question and hopefully get behind, can bad philosophy produce good science? Right, and I think what we're trying to ask today is when we look at all of the things happening in our world, uh, not just in the news, but in our universities and in our churches, are there consequences to our philosophy that are ending up in our science that we're not tracing back to uh, the fallacies that are embraced in, in creating them and ultimately asking, is there a connection between how we think or what data we bring in and our conclusions? And I think one of the, the, the dangers that we have today is that we watch the news and we watch the conclusions that whether you're on the left or the right want us to draw and we're not challenging the presuppositions that really went into coming up with those conclusions and we're finding that not only has this made consequences uh, apparent in the church but in medicine in politics in the family uh, in our schools that if we don't get to the root of how we're really understanding information, how we're translating facts, then we're going to end up, as we are today in 2020, in left field, really confused about what it means to be a man or really confused about what it means to be a Christian. Right. And so the, the real question is, how do we define truth? Now, Jesus said he was truth. He identified, not as he said, I have some truthful things that I can say, but because we have been, most of us alive today for sure, um, and people who our schools had us read, because we've been inundated with enlightenment philosophy, we somehow said that there's truth that everybody can agree on, whether or not you acknowledge God as creator and savior. And that's just not true. Right. And you know, the scripture, as our standard says that, not only is he the truth, but that all things are held together by him. And so in Reformed theology proper, we talk about how God, being the creator of all things, is the only completely knowledgeable source of truth. So the only thing that knows exhaustively everything about all creation is the thing that made <laughs> all of creation. That's our Lord. And so there is, at the bottom of our epistemology, the bottom of how we know what things are, this basic uh, assertion that God is the source of truth and that we as creatures can only know what is true, what is good, what is beautiful, what is right, what is correct, what is accurate, because as creatures we look for that through God. St. Paul describes the experience of of the human in creation as moving and having our being inside of God's creation. And so what we find today, and really this has been a downward intellectual slope since the uh, Enlightenment, is that when we remove the axiom of God is truth from our epistemology, then what truth is becomes mistruth, becomes falsehood, becomes conjecture, becomes opinion. And unfortunately, uh, the Christian who wants to see progress or development in society must return to that basic axiom that uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Now, a lot of people who are listening right now would probably say, oh, I know all that. I'm immune to that. I'm a believer. I believe the, the, the scripture is the word of God. But I think if they were to examine areas where they have allowed um, the camel's nose under the tent, as the expression goes, that we often will repair to the idea that the experts say, or the person with the degrees will say, and we don't realize that we have succumbed to a fallacy that says the expert, or the person who looks good, or the person who can spout off a bunch of statistics, if those facts, and I'll put facts in quote, 
are not interpreted from a biblical world and life view, we can end up with some very disastrous results. That's right. And so there's a little bit of, of Christian education that has to happen here. Not only do we have to affirm and speak that the Bible is our standard, but we also have to say that the character of God determines kind of the rules of engagement. So in introductory philosophy classes, and the modern Christian needs to realize that philosophy and theology for most of Western history are the same thing, but the modern philosophy class begins by defining rules of engagement. It talks about what is a presupposition, what is a logical fallacy, how do you deduce and come to conclusions based on facts and evidences and presuppositions. And I think that this is really where many Christians are weak. We haven't looked through the logical fallacies, and so we have fallen prey. We're vulnerable to fallacies as they're put forward in news, put forward in literature, in magazines, on the television. And so Christians need to go back and say, if God is a God of order, he's the creator of the universe, and all things reflect his perfect unity and uh, his identity as the exhaustible or inexhaustible creator of all things, then there should be in our reasoning a sense of, of logic and non-fallacy-based thinking. So a really good example of this um, antithesis between what God says, thus saith the Lord, and what the humanist man says, is that when, when we're trying to be convinced to do something, currently it's about should you wear masks, not wear masks, should you gather together socially or not, should, what is social distancing? Interestingly enough, they bring in celebrities to do public service announcements to say, wear a mask, care about people. Now, the truth of the matter is, whether or not that celebrity knows anything about science, nobody's putting him or her there because they have scientific degrees. But if we liked that person in a movie, or if that person sings songs that we like, we're supposed to then make the mental jump that says, well, what they're saying must be true. What's obviously missing from similar public service announcements is, thus saith the Lord. God's word says X, Y, Z on the subject, because that's not an area that our modern culture wants to go. Right. And it's really a discussion on authority. And so the Christian says God's word is our authority. And because God created all things and speaks to all things, he's the authority in every sphere. Um, but what our temptation is, and it's the temptation from Adam and Eve in the garden all the way throughout the entire biblical narrative, is our attempt, our, our temptation is to place our own authority, our own sense of expertise, our own uh, data or science or whatever type of human authority we can muster in place of thus saith the Lord. And so when we look at our current you know, medical crisis or, or health crisis, however you want to describe the COVID thing, it's really a crisis of authority. Which expert do we believe? Do we believe the expert who has the most degrees? Do we believe the expert who's done the most studies? Do we believe the expert who's had the most experience in clinics? Do we believe the expert who's met with the most clients or the most hospital patients? And these competing sense of experts add to the confusion of where is the authority? And so Christians have to take a step back and say, where does the Lord speak to this? And where are we falling into the pitfalls or the traps of logical fallacies? Interestingly enough, when you talked about authority, where a lot of these things brew are in modern universities. And a really glaring example of this is that if you went back 30 years ago, 40 years ago, nobody would be confused whether or not he was a he and she was a she. But with the wave of the... Um, influx of discussions on this in university settings, there actually is somewhat of an epidemic 
of young women actually mutilating themselves to separate themselves from their femaleness. And so somebody has communicated to this group of women that who they are isn't really who they are. Yes, and it began with uh, taking something that was uh, outside of God's authority and tolerating it, and then it progressively moved to acceptance of it, and then to the celebration of something that was outside of God's natural order. Now, there's in the in the university campus, there's been a, a push towards acceptance of transgenderism and LGBT rights and all of those things for the last 50 years, as you've said. But what we see today, and there's actually a new book uh, called Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schreer, uh, which talks about that this movement of denying the reality of who you were biologically made to be has actually infiltrated down into middle schools. We have girls who are 12, 13, 14 years old who are electing to have uh, gender reassignment surgeries. Uh, they're binding their chests. They're taking testosterone. Um, they're having irreparable damage done to their bodies. They're causing uh, themselves to skip per periods or even to skip puberty for the sake of not some uh, mental dysphoria or gender dysphoria, but because they wanted acceptance from the experts in their culture. You know, young girls who were on the margins wanted acceptance from people on YouTube or on social media or a group of transgender friends. And so what we see is whatever we make as our authority, whatever says this is good, this is allowed, these are the experts, ultimately moves that pattern of toleration, acceptance, and celebration away from what God says this is good and this is right. And to me, and, and maybe you would disagree, but this really manifests a war on women. If you think of all the things that um, have happened in modern culture, the acceptance of fornication as just freedom, and you should be able to do what you want with your own body. Well, if there hadn't been fornication, there wouldn't be this overall need for birth control pills or abortion. And so you convince people that something that is inherently obviously wrong, that most people would repel against, you educate into thinking that this chain is actually a freedom. And so think about having girls delay puberty, delay um, the onset of um, things that make them like women. So what you're really telling these women is that they should continue to look like boys because boys don't have curves and boys don't have, you know, developed breasts. And does this not make them potentially easier targets because these things won't produce happiness and a sense of satisfaction, all this chemical altering and butchery that's done to them will make them most vulnerable. So are these people being set up to be exploited by those who want to have a ready supply of people to exploit? Right, and you can see in just the practical outcomes of this that it's biological women uh, who are the first victims of kind of transgender uh, toleration. And not just in the sense that biological women are being mutilated, as you describe, but how many stories have we seen over the past several years of transgender women, so men who pretend to be women, going into lock rooms and exposing themselves to young women? Who's the victim there? It's biological women. It's a war on women. These men coming into their personal space and invading or even something as you know might be superficial as sports for for many many years uh, and i know that your your daughters participated in golf and, and different uh, active sports but women have been you know working towards achievement setting records uh, accomplishing something in the athletic field and here it is men pretending to be women are coming and taking away their achievements. They're suppressing actual women accomplishments, women's accomplishments for the sake of some strange, perverse uh, psychological neurosis. And so there is certainly a war on women. And I think that the 
political climate is meant to turn the value of women and destroy it uh, for the sake of uh, this war you talk about? Look at abortion. How easy is it for a man to impregnate a woman, not want to take responsibility for her or his offspring? He, what, throws a couple of hundred dollars at her. She's the one who goes through the surgery or the chemical abortion. And she's the one who maybe years later can't get pregnant and have a family. Or now when she does, the full force of what happened to her and what she participated in now weighs on her. So when the scripture talks about women as the weaker vessel, the enemies of God like to say, oh, that just means that the Bible doesn't think women as smart as men. No, that's not what it means at all. I like to make the analogy that fine crystal isn't what you use every day. It's fine crystal. It's expensive crystal. You keep it in a good place and you bring it out for special occasions. It's not common. So that's what the Bible is talking about, protecting women, also protecting children. And yet modern society, as you put it, in this area of transgenderism, is going after people in middle school right at the time where instead of having a godly perspective on gender and sex and marriage, all sorts of these other aberrations are thrown at them. And so maybe the easiest thing to do is figure out what the trend of the day is and decide that that's what you're going to jump into. Right. And, and some people listening might be thinking, uh, well, is there some type of conspiracy or is there some type of hidden agenda? And I don't think that we're, we're saying that the war on women is, is kind of orchestrated by some secret organization that wants to destroy the family. but there is an anti-Christian sentiment in government schools, an anti-Christian sentiment amongst LGBTQ activists. And you can see that they certainly have a very obvious agenda to mislead our children. Uh, here in California, there's, and we've done podcasts on this, there's an active curriculum that four and five-year-olds in government schools need to be exposed to gender identity. They'll take four and five year olds and say, you've been told that there's boys and girls, but actually there are a number of other genders. And so this kind of uh, perverse sexual conditioning or planting the seeds for confusion is being put into children. You know, four and five years old kindergartners are being taught this kind of transgenderism. And the problem is that Christians have withdrawn the authority of God's word and allowed individuals or their government or their local schools for the sake of toleration or for the sake of peace to allow these things into their communities. And what's really uh, disappointing and difficult is that we'll hear a lot of things about how the homosexual lobby is uh, describing the youth experience and how they have greater suicide rates because of supposed persecution or lack of toleration of their beliefs. But what we see uh, today, and especially in this book by Mrs. Schreer, is that these transgender folks, they're the ones who are really suffering because there are consequences in mental health, there are consequences in physical health for this bad philosophy. What we see is if you leave God's authority and you go and trust in man's, you don't end up at a consequence that's neutral. This actually hurts these girls. They are being scarred on their body, their soul, their mind, their, for the rest of their lives because Christians refuse to say God's word knows what's best for our children. You know, it reminds me of Dr. Rush Dooney's book, The Death of Meaning. And, and I think that's what we're seeing here. If words no longer have meaning, if I can't say girl, and I know what a girl is, and I know what a boy is, and you hear people now, activists saying, the question is, well, can men have babies? Can men get pregnant? And the answer is yes, if they're transgender men. In other words, <laughs> now everything doesn't make sense. So why bother even having education? which is a very interesting thing right now, since so many states are basically saying, we're not gonna send children to school 
but we want them to do online learning. You have to wonder, what is this online learning and what can these children be exposed to that it would be very hard for parents to know? Because the parent's going to watch everything the child is watching. But no, we know that parents have to go to work, especially now with people who have maybe been out of work. So I do think there's an agenda. I do think the principalities and powers which we fight use human pawns to carry it out. But it's very hard now to feel comfortable saying things that the Bible says explicitly are wrong. If you say it, then somebody says you're hateful, and there are too many people who are afraid of being labeled hateful, that they actually, without knowing it, try to figure out how they are being hateful and how I, I, I should stop being hateful here and accept people, even if what they're doing is heading themselves off a cliff at 100 miles an hour. That's right. Well, and I think it, that this current crisis where we have, you know, states against the government or you know, local states against the federal government in how to decide what to do for uh, quarantines or reopening reveals, and I think most people are beginning to see, that our medical experts are not just going to the facts, right? That there is a political element to the authority of their experts. And I think Christians need to take a step back and reevaluate all of the advice that they're getting recognizing that what they've learned this last year is that every truth that they've been taught has an underlying agenda. It has a presupposition. And so we need to evaluate how consistent our experts are. Now, there's a, a almost comical situation happening in Louisiana where to encourage COVID testing, the local uh, ward is giving away coupons to McDonald's value meals in exchange for coming and getting tested. So folks are reticent to come get tested for COVID because they're afraid of the contract tracing or they're afraid of being quarantined for two weeks or whatever reason, you know, they want to avoid a vaccine, however they feel. But the, the government, local government solution to encourage them is to give them processed food, sugar, <laughs> water, you know, high carb wheat and fake meat in order to do something for the sake of health. And, and I think most people, when they think about the local health department or the, the state department of public health, they have this idea that those experts are doing what they do because they believe it's the best thing for the people they serve. But what we're seeing is that there are other factors involved. There's a political element. And even if it's not Democrat versus Republican, there are other logical fallacies that these people have embraced that make their authority questionable. And so Christians need to come back and say, okay, if our goal is healthy people and they're going to do everything they can to get people healthy from COVID, why are they ignoring the 99%? 0.9% of people who have uh, healthy outcomes, but would be better served if they had healthy diet, exercise, if they had herd immunity? Why are they ignoring the most helpful things and focusing in on the most invasive or the most constrictive or the most liberty taking ideas and recognizing that our experts are experts because of some political power, not because they are omnipotent or uh, omniscient like our Lord. Right. And the I, idea that they even care about you. You know, I remember when I was teaching my children and I asked them, did Satan really care about Adam and Eve? I mean, when they were kicked out of the garden, was he there to say, hey, you know, I knew he was bad. I'll now help you out. No, because his goal was to strike at God. And the way he was striking at God was to strike at them. And I think the same thing, people are coming to that conclusion when they realize that the people who are saying, you know, stay home, wear a mask, are people who are still getting paid. Their, 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 their paycheck keeps coming in, right? Or the people who say, we don't wanna have school choice and we hate charter schools. 
they send their children to private schools. So there's what, what people are waking up to this, but I don't think Christians should say hallelujah, they're waking up. Because the parable that Jesus told is you get rid of one demon, you sweep the house clean. If you do not replace it, seven more will come in and take its their place. So when we see people questioning, when we see people distraught over the fact that they're coming to terms with the fact that they've been lied to, it's time for all Christians, not just the professional class of clergy, to come in and really direct them to the scripture, to the law of God and the application. So instead of saying our schools need to be open, you know, why not have Christian churches putting up scholarship money so that Christian kids from families that can't afford it have scholarships to go to a Christian school? Why don't we help the families that could homeschool if there was additional money coming in so they didn't have to be a two income family? See, that would be thinking constructively and it would fill the house so that seven more demons couldn't come in. Right. And that's thinking like a, a good Christian as well. Because what I think the, the pitfall we fall into with appealing to authority or appealing to experts is we embrace, uh, and I think Dr. Rushton would agree with me here, is an evolutionary view of the world. You know, Christians want to be passive and allow you know, the medical profession and its experts to sort things out, and then we get the product or the end result of that particular you know, separated from us process. You know, the medical professionals, Dr. Fauci or, or the CDC, they'll figure out what the best process is, and then we'll get the result at the other end. It's very similar to the theory of, of evolution. You know, we don't have a personal role in it, but there are these natural processes that experts describe to us, and then we get the benefit at the other end. What you're describing is a creationist view of human history. It says that instead of depending on experts or outside uh, non-personal forces that the Christian, the head of the household, the, the woman of the household, the individual, the local church, these personal forces are called to be active agents in culture. So we don't depend on the, the processes of the state or the process of the medical field or the experts in this particular thing to tell us how things are going to be. No, we as dominion man and dominion woman say, this is how my household will serve. And like you said, we're going to put individual personal action behind our faith. And that's how we're going to move forward. Yes. And I can say from personal experience, six years ago, I had a, what most people would consider a health emergency. And I had to really reflect on how I was going to move on. By God's grace, I'm still here. But how was I going to move on? How was I going to live differently? And I, it got me into a lot of um, difficult discussions with some of the medical people um, I was seeing because they wanted to give all sorts of medications to prevent this from happening again. And my premise was, okay, I know I live in a fallen world and I know that eventually I'm going to pass on. But can I trust the fact that God made my body in such a way that it could heal itself it, or it could make things better? Or did I have to go from the point of view that I'm damaged and I will always be damaged? And I have to say, by having a faith in the fact that the circulatory system, the nervous system, the muscular system, the skeletal system, these are not accidents. These are fashioned designs that glorify God. And so if I can learn how to be in sync with God and his word and his law, I'm going to do much better than to rely on those people who don't necessarily acknowledge him. That's right. Well, and I think that you're getting to one of the conversations we have today in the public sphere, and that is, you know, what takes precedence? Uh, are we people of faith or are we a people of science? And in fact, you'll, you'll see news headlines that talk about, you know, we need to trust the scientists, trust the medical, uh, medical professionals. We need to trust science, not religion, or science, not faith. And uh, Dr. Rushdoony has a, 
a great quip on this. And he asks the question, did evolution kill God, right? So the idea is the modern man, when they embrace science, they have no longer a need for God, and so they get rid of God. But Rushdie says the exact opposite happened. Evolution did not kill God, but evolution kills man. Because what it does is it takes away God's image in mankind, but it also takes away the agency for creating a society that actually protects people's livelihoods, their humanity, their health, their purpose. And so embracing a worldview that is completely scientific is going to lead to you know, inconsistencies and fallacies. But embracing a worldview that has science without the presuppositions of the Bible will also destroy mankind. And that's how we can live in a, a culture that is anti-health, yet proclaims to spend millions, probably billions of dollars on healthcare, to spend hours and hours every single day talking about what's best for the health of the people, and yet completely miss what is actually healthy according to human standards. Yeah, when you think about it, when we have the designation that we've all heard about what is essential and what is not essential in our culture, I find it interesting that big stores, and I won't name names, but like warehouse stores, they're fine to be open. Most times people walk through those stores, want to get in, want to get out. They don't exactly have community or fellowship. So the things that have been deemed non-essential are the areas where people could actually talk and share with each other. And oftentimes you can find out what a group of people is most threatened by, by the groups they want to stop or silence. I use this a lot with women I mentor. Why was the housewife the target in the 60s? Well, if you want to destroy the family, convince the woman that what she's doing isn't important, make her stereotypically stupid, and convince her that to have real worth, instead of serving her husband and her children, she has to go and serve at an office somewhere and a bunch of people who she doesn't have the same intimate interest in. Well, churches being deemed non-essential, guess what? That's the place where you're going to hear about God, find out about the application of God's word to your life, and that must be deemed so dangerous to the current agenda that we want to make sure people don't go there. And how sad that there are too many churches that said, instead of listening to the scripture, that we should not refrain from meeting with each other and that we should come together as a congregation to praise God, that that was non-essential. And people said, we need to be good citizens and thereby deny obedience to God. Right. And I think that we would describe this process of making us good citizens. That's a type of, of psychological conditioning. And what we have seen as we've moved away from the foundations of Protestant Christianity is an escape from maturity, an escape from responsibility. And uh, Dr. Rushdie makes the point uh, in the mythology of science that man is called to be a responsible being, right? He's called to be an ethical creature. So he has to know right from wrong. He has to recognize that he's a sinner and he has to move towards God's law, God's justice, God's purposes for his life. But what do we see in all of our modern crises? The definition of sin has changed. So instead of sin being an act of disobedience to God's law, the true sin in our age is not recognizing somebody's gender dysmorphia. Or the true sin is not recognizing how homosexual love is equal to heterosexual love, right? So they've moved the definition of sin, and then they've moved the definition of how you fix the sin. No longer is it about personal responsibility. I did what was wrong because I'm selfish and my nature is completely depraved. But rather, you know, criminals are criminals because of how they were raised, the conditioning of their circumstances. Or what's even what we're seeing in our, our medical conversations is this type of conditioning is put in their solutions. So it's not so much that you're responsible for your personal health. If you get sick, it's not because you're, you didn't eat right or you didn't exercise or you didn't take care of your body. It's because somebody else didn't wear a mask or somebody else didn't follow the 
prescribed conditioning standards of social distancing or walking the right way down a grocery store aisle. And I think that is getting to uh, the point of what we're trying to say here is that when we talk about Christian response to these experts and what they're going on, we can't be blaming other people like the secular humanist. Of it. We have to go back to what can we as Christians embrace as truth because God says it is, and then what can we do to put our hands to the plow and begin repairing, rebuilding our families and our culture in terms of not these strange power-hungry logical fallacies, but in terms of God's word and God's blessings. Yeah, I mean, you said that, you know, not accepting people's sexual orientation. Well, lately, the word racism and privilege are thrown about. Now think of who that's an attack on. I had no control over what color my skin is, my hair, my eyes, neither did you. So if what we are intrinsically is wrong, kind of like I look like a female, but I'm really supposed to think I'm a male, the war is against God. God made a mistake. God made a mistake with my gender. God made a mistake with my with my color. And so how do you fix things you didn't do? And so as you put it, sin now is not what you do or don't do. It's who you are. And that, of course, goes against the idea that God's creation at the end of the six days, he said it was good. And in Adam and Eve was the capacity for all these different colors and characteristics. He said it was good. Who are we to say it was bad? Right. And so I think that this comes down to personal relationships because where this breaks down, and I know you've met with women who've had this problem and, and men who've had this problem. I've met with, with families who have been through this crisis is what do we do when it's our own children who are struggling with uh, sources of authority from the world? What do we do with our own families when we're struggling with who do we trust? Where do we go as our ultimate standard? And it comes to us not by people putting, do you believe Romans 1 or do you believe uh, Darwin's laws of, of evolution? That's not how the question will come. The question will come in this way. You're daughter is in a uh, government program, a school or a soccer team or a youth group, and she's going to come home and say, everybody uh, in my group is transgender, and I think I might have been born in the wrong body too. I'd like to have hormone therapy. And it might sound far-fetched, but this is what's happening to thousands and thousands of young women in our country right now. And the way that the medical establishment is set up is the parent has no authority. And even the doctor, if they recognize that this woman is doing it because of just pure pressure and has no real medical diagnosis for something like this, they can't criticize her. And so the Christian has to be willing to speak the truth, even in our own families, and be willing to say God's standard applies, even when it's those close to us. I think we can also be proactive. I think it's foolish not to prepare children who are either being homeschooled or in Christian schools to know what those people who are going to be deemed their peers are being exposed to. And common sense actually is on our side. You know, if somebody wants to get their car fixed, they don't, you know, say, eedy, beeny, miny, mo or this one's the cheapest or whatever. If they care about their car, they're going to at least research enough to find a mechanic who's going to be able to do a good job. The same thing has to do if they're planning a big party. They look around at restaurants, where are we going to have our, our reception? And they're going to look at the cost as re, and, and the, the quality of the service and the quality of the food, right? But so many people just decide that somehow the school down the street or the school in their district is going to be the best they can produce for their children. And I dare say, some people have their priorities all wrong, that instead of shelling out the money for a private education, they're going to 
put their efforts and their money other places, getting their kids trinkets, toys, the latest technology. And really what they're doing is they're setting their children up for failure. And then they're going to have potentially one of those very unpleasant conversations where Susie comes home and says she's really Sylvester and um, the social worker, the teachers, everybody will tell the parents, don't argue with her because if you do, we will take her out of the home and we'll also charge you for whoever takes care of her. That's right. And, you know, this isn't the first time that Christianity or Christians have had to deal with a sense of, of misguided authority. You know, it's maybe strange to hear this, but Protestantism or Reformation Christianity is born out of a rejection of this type of absolute authority. You know, in theological circles, we talk about how the Roman church claimed the power to speak ex cathedra with absolute authority. And in fact, the Pope and the, the councils of the Catholic church have said that they admit that they can make no errors, right? There's no contradictions. There's no mistakes. They're always right. Well, in response to that, the Protestants brought Christianity back to the word of God and formed cultures around that word and took the political power, a lot of the religious power away from the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is very different today than it was 400 years ago. But still, we're having this same type of conversation, not with in the church, but with the state with the medical professions, with our local politicians, with our families. And we have to be willing to say, so the scriptura. We have to be willing to say that the scripture says there's one standard. And that if we look deep enough into what our experts are telling us, we're going to find that they're not infallible. And therefore, we have to hold them to that standard, recognizing that there's really only one perfect standard. Yes. So usually we make recommendations on reading. And uh, whereas I don't disagree anything you said that we have to say sola scriptura, but that should not be confused to mean you only read the Bible and you don't read anything else. We talked about last week, the importance of having a multitude of counselors. And by God's grace in every age, we have had teachers, some of them living, some of them long since gone to their reward, but we have the opportunity to learn the application of scripture. So I would wholeheartedly recommend for people who are looking at an introduction to what we're talking about, Rush Dooney's volume, Law and Liberty, and then also his book, Faith and Wellness, that has a subtitle, Resisting the State Control of Healthcare by Restoring the Priestly Calling of Doctors. And that will open your eyes to the fact that maybe you shouldn't be getting your health and medical advice from people who are controlled and paid by the state to come up with opinions, et cetera. Start, relate, start establishing personal relationships with a doctor who will take everything into consideration. Ideally, it should be a Christian doctor who's going to embrace the idea that God made the human body able to thrive when dealt with appropriately. So, for example, you want to be healthy, don't do the things that the Bible says you shouldn't do. You want to be healthy, do those things that the Bible says you should do. And I don't think people are making an adequate case for that today. Again, another Rush Dooney title to, to read is The Mythology of Science and really get an idea of what it means to trust the experts. I think what we are missing today is that kind of spirit of, of inquiry and questioning authority that was so popular 50 years ago. It seems as though those radicals who told us, those radicals who told us to question everything and to never trust authority have now become the authority and want our allegiance unquestionably. So we should be suspect of that type of thinking. Yes, the whole ploy to be tolerant, the whole ploy to be accepting was only until that the culture shift was sufficiently progressed that instead of saying accept everybody, no matter what their orientation is, now it's only accept those people who agree with what we say is the right way. 
And I'm going to go back to something I said a little bit earlier. When you encounter people who are starting to ask the questions, be ready to come in and help provide solutions. If people have candidates who would do very well or should be in a Christian school, how many families could just allocate a little bit of money and put towards that to help that kid get a Christian education? No, you're probably not going to be featured in magazines or anything like that. But I think we need to start scholarship funds so that people who recognize the need for their children to be raised as Christians have the opportunity for that. That's right. And it's so much of our work has to be personal. Christians must refuse to allow the work to be done by other people. Because where we are at today is because we've allowed the experts to rule us. We have to move past that and say, a housewife is going to be the difference maker. My children are going to be the difference makers. My church is going to be the difference makers. And the reality is, reformations in history didn't take huge armies. They didn't take full universities. They took a handful a small minority of people who stood diligently by the word of God. That's where the power of transformation is. It's in the authority of God's word, even if it's just a few of us. Because these solutions are common sense. These solutions are what works. Everything else is the death of meaning, the death of man, the embrace of destruction. So let's take confidence in that God has given you as the vice regent of his kingdom power. He has given you authority. He has given you success if we were just faithful in these areas where we've been called. Can't say it better than that. Thank you, Steve. Listeners, thanks for joining us again. Feel free to contact us through our email address, out of the question podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.